Well, the last time we met, we ended in the midst of our study of Deuteronomy chapter 10 by discussing this rhetorical but powerful question <clears> that's <throat> asked by Moses as he stood on the hilltop in Moab addressing the chosen people. The question was, and now, O Israel, what does Jehovah your God demand of you? Pretty big question. And Moses answers his own question with this instruction. God's redeemed ought to revere Jehovah, walk in his ways, love him, serve him, and obey his laws and commandments. Revere, walk, love, serve, obey. And so I asked you a rhetorical question of my own, and believe me, this is a loaded question. Do you wish only to be granted your salvation and then kind of float through the rest of your life carefree, believing that your sins are covered anyway? So why worry about your decisions and your attitude and your behavior? That is, do you believe that once you trust Yeshua, our Messiah, that you have utterly no further obligations to him? that there will be no consequences for your morality and for your actions or perhaps for your inactions? Have you decided that you can completely separate your knowledge of what he's done for you from your worship of him and from the way you live? Let me say without hesitation or doubt, that precise implication is rife with the modern church and even brings into question whether any form of believer's obedience to the written word is actually a form of legalism. Therefore, it's a bad thing. And I speak today in firm opposition to such an ungodly doctrine whose basis is nothing more than a desire to distance the Gentile church from the Hebrew Torah and to make the life of a Christian seem as though from the moment of our salvation and we have gained the right to retire from the duty to do any more than merely exist as we await heaven. Moses says, redeemed of Israel, you have things to do. Modern Christianity says, redeemed of Christ, Quit now. Have it your way and save your energy. That's wrong. And we discussed this rather thoroughly last time, so we won't repeat it. But you can rest assured that I won't rest until I've done all I can to persuade you that you do have obligations to the Lord. And that simply having an inner sensation of love towards Him isn't going to suffice as the proper response to his unmatchable gift of redemption. It has become a rather standard doctrine in some denomination that God seeks from us only a feeling of love in our hearts and that to do much of anything other than to enjoy ourselves in the company of other Christians and maybe to attend a worship service occasionally is actually a negative. And I remind you, here in Deuteronomy, God is giving all, giving, giving all of these instructions to a people that are already redeemed. And this is the pattern of God that naturally flows through to our era, as do all of his patterns. First, we're redeemed, and only then does he give us his commandments and instructions. His commandments and instructions aren't for those who are not already redeemed, saved in Christian jargon. Again, his commandments and his instructions, here called the law, aren't for the purpose of redemption. Redemption's a free gift. It's given to whomever God chooses to give it. It's always been a free gift, even in the time of Moses. 
The laws of God are for the purpose of instructing redeemed people on how to live out a redeemed life. Further, the Lord demands that there is a way that he be shown love. One of the standard questions that a marriage counselor will ask a husband and a wife is, how do you want to be shown love? Most men struggle with that question, often not even understanding what it means. But most women instantly have an answer to that one. And the marriage counselors I'm acquainted with say that the central problems within marriages is a spouse not being willing to show love to their partner in ways that that partner can recognize and accept as genuine love. The Bible does offer us a generalization about this issue of love within human marriage. It says that women should respect their husbands. Husbands should show love to their wives. God's word explains that a wife submitting to her husband is how she shows him respect, which is what equates to love for a man. Alternately, a husband shows his wife the love she seeks by putting her above himself. By demonstrating that he would give up his own life to protect hers if need be. And by being kind and gentle and cognizant of her needs and concerns. Again, this is of course a generality. But I think I've not run across a married couple that wouldn't agree with that basic premise. And of course, as individuals, we each have specific things that indicate love to us. For women, often it's simply her husband saying, I love you, verbally, on a fairly regular basis. For others, it might be a surprise remembrance, like a bunch of flowers, an unexpected gift. For a man, it might be his wife fixing meals for him that she knows are his favorites, or doing a wonderful job raising his children, caring for their home, or regularly seeking his advice, sometimes even his permission, on matters that he doesn't even necessarily believe he ought to be the one who decides. But here's the thing. For the woman who craves to hear, I love you from, from her husband, but has a husband that simply cannot or will not say it, she's not being loved in a way that she understands as love. And while that doesn't mean the marriage will fail, the relationship, equally as certain, will not be as fulfilling as it could be. It's the same way in our relationship with God. He has unequivocally told us in very plain terms how he wants to be shown love. He says that for him, love begins with obedience to his laws and commandments. He says that to revere him to walk in the ways he has ordained, to serve him faithfully, to obey him, that shows him that we love him in the way he wants to be loved. We can not revere him, not walk in his ways, not serve him, not be obedient to him, and maybe still love him to some degree. Perhaps from our side of the equation, we think we can, but according to the Bible, not from his. What kind of relationship does that say we have with the Lord if we are insisting we love him, but he says, no, you're not? Let's read the last few verses of Deuteronomy chapter 10. Deuteronomy 10, we'll start at verse 12. Go to the end. It starts on page 209 if you have a complete Jewish Bible. So now, Israel, all that Adonai your God asks from you is to fear Adonai your God, to follow his ways, love him, serve Adonai your God with all your heart and all of your being, to obey for your own good, the commandments and regulations of Adonai, which I'm giving you today. See, the sky, 
the heaven beyond the sky, the earth, everything on it, all belongs to Adonai, your God. Only Adonai took enough pleasure in your ancestors to love them and choose their descendants after them, yourselves, above all peoples, as he still does today. Therefore, circumcise the foreskin of your heart. Don't be stiff-necked any longer. For Adonai, your God, is a God of gods, Lord of lords, the great, the mighty, the awesome God who has no favorites. He accepts no bribes. He secures justice for the orphan and the widow. He loves the foreigner, giving him food and clothing. Therefore, you are to love the foreigner, since you were foreigners in the land of Egypt. You are to fear Adonai, your God, serve him, cling to him, swear by his name. He is your praise. He is your God, who has done for you these great, awesome things, which you've seen with your own eyes. Your ancestors went down into Egypt with only 70 people, but now Adonai, your God, has made your numbers as many as the stars in the sky. Well, after explaining what God requires of his redeemed people, a strange statement is made in verse 16. We're going to find repeated at regular intervals in the remainder of the Old Testament and in several key places in the New. It is that the Lord wants circumcised hearts more than he wants circumcised foreskins. Now remember, remember, cross out the word heart because of what the word heart means to our 21st century lingo. Instead, insert the word mind because that is what heart meant to the people of the Bible era. So this is saying to circumcise our will, our thoughts, our mental processes. The illustration is that to circumcise the foreskin of your heart means to remove the protective, even the impenetrable covering over your mind and decisions that keeps God from entering in. It means to stop being hard-headed. And so blocking the word of God from taking root in your thoughts. But it's also a dualism. That is, in addition to what I've just explained that it illustrates, it's also explaining that while the circumcision of the flesh is the God-ordained sign of the Abrahamic covenants to be worn by all Hebrew males, a circumcised heart, a circumcised mind, should be the inward spiritual companion of that outwardly fleshly operation. Paul says the same thing some 1,400 years after Moses first said it. wonder where he got it from. In fact, Paul says that a fleshly circumcision without the accompanying change of mind that moves us towards harmony with God is eternally worthless. Further, that since the advent of Messiah, one does not need a circumcision of the flesh in order to demonstrate or achieve a circumcision of the heart, of the mind. Therefore, in typical Hebrew style, a literary couplet is written because the next words are, so don't be a stiff-necked people. Stiff-necked means stubborn or unresponsive. That is, Moses is saying to Israel that by allowing your heart to be circumcised by the Holy Spirit, you will no longer be a hard-headed person. Therefore, God's people, do not be a nation of stubborn people because you've refused the circumcision of your mind by the Lord. I need you to hear this, please. Your faith in Christ does not necessarily equal a circumcised heart. Your redemption meaning that you have faith that Yeshua died for your sins, doesn't mean you have the change of mind that can come only by means of an act of God through the Holy Spirit by making your mind responsive to Him. Listen to this passage from the book of Hebrews. When the emissaries in Jerusalem heard that Shomron had received the word of God, they sent Actually, this is in the book of Acts, I'm sorry. 
When the emissaries in Jerusalem heard that Shomron had received the word of God, they sent them Kepha and Yochanan, uh, Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit. For until then he had not come upon any of them. They had only been immersed into the name of the Lord Yeshua. Then as Peter and John placed their hands on them, they received the Holy Spirit. The Israelites were a redeemed people the instant of that Passover, first Passover in Egypt. But they had not received God's laws and commands. They didn't yet have circumcised hearts that made their minds responsive to him and to that law. Thus they did great sins out in the wilderness with thousands of them dying and God determining more than once, he was just going to go ahead and exterminate them all. Except only by Moses' arbitration on their behalf with God. And as believers, we are indeed redeemed the moment we have that simplest faith that Jesus is Lord. However, just as the Israelites needed circumcised minds, brought about by an act of God so that they were capable of being obedient to him, so do we. Moses continues with his argument as to why Israel should be obedient, why Israel should pay attention to God, and, it, and that God is the greatest of all beings. He uses words that were well understood for that day, Lord of lords, God of gods. Now this language sounds like an acknowledgement of multiple gods with one God, Yehovah, being higher than all the other gods, even though it's actually a statement of monotheism. But common language of the day, within the common understanding of the day, is what's needed, and it's used to get a point across, and that's the sense of it here. But Yehovah is a very unique God who doesn't take bribes, which was customary for that time. And his justice insists that Israelite widows and orphans be tenderly cared for by Israelite society. Even more, God loves those who aren't even part of Israel. Therefore, the stranger, the resident alien that lives among Israel, the ger in Hebrew, must also have food and clothing provided if they have no means to obtain it due to poverty or circumstances. Because God is no respecter of individuals, he's not impressed with aristocrats. He wants equal justice for everyone. Therefore, as the Lord's earthly representatives, Israel is to love the ger, the stranger, the foreigner, in order to show them that the God of Israel loves them. Now, this should all sound pretty familiar to us, as these are, of course, exactly the same principles that Jesus taught. And it also explains why the Lord made a way for non-Hebrews, Gentiles, to be redeemed. He loves all humanity, not just those born to a certain tribe or a nation. Yet it is indeed only by me of divine covenants made with a certain people, the people spawned by Jacob, that foreigners can even be redeemed. They, we, don't get a separate Gentile covenant. We don't get to have a European Messiah of our own apart from Israel's. Let's move on to chapter 11. Deuteronomy chapter 11, we'll read it all. Page 209. Page 209, if you have a complete Jewish Bible. Wouldn't it be nice if they were all numbered just the same? Therefore, you are to love Adonai your God and obey his commission, regulations, rulings, and mitzvot, commandments. Today it is you I am addressing, not your children who haven't known or experienced the discipline of Adonai your God 
his greatness, his strong, his strong hand, his outstretched arm, his signs and his actions, which he did in Egypt to Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and to his entire country. They didn't experience what he did to Egypt's army and horses and chariots. How Adonai overwhelmed them with the water of the Sea of Suf as they were pursuing you, so that they remain destroyed to this day. They didn't experience what he kept doing for you in the desert until you arrived at this place, or what he did to Tatan and Avaram, the sons of Eliab, the descendants of Reuben. How the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them up, along with their households, tents, everything living in their company. They're in front of all Israel. But you've seen with your own eyes all of these great deeds of Adonai. Therefore, you are to keep every commandment I'm giving you today so that you will be strong enough to go in and take possession of the land you are crossing over to conquer. So that you will live long in the land Adonai swore to give to your ancestors and their descendants, a land flowing with milk and honey. For the land you are entering in order to take possession of it isn't like the land of Egypt. There, you'd sow your seed and had to use your feet to operate its irrigation system as in a vegetable garden. But the land you're crossing over to take possession of it is a land of hills and valleys, which soaks up water when rain falls from the sky. It is a land Adonai your God cares for. The eyes of Adonai your God are always on it from the beginning of the year to the end of the year. So if you listen carefully to my commandments, which I'm giving you today, to love Adonai your God, to serve him with all of your heart and all of your being, then, says Adonai, I will give your land its rain at the right seasons, including the early fall rains, the late spring rains, so that you can gather in your wheat, your new wine and olive oil. I will give your fields grass for your livestock, with the result that you will eat and be satisfied. But be careful not to let yourselves be seduced so that you turn aside, serving other gods and worshiping them. If you do, the anger of Adonai will blaze up against you. He will shut up the sky so that there will be no rain. The ground won't yield its produce, and you will quickly pass away from the good land Adonai is giving you. Therefore, you are to store up these words of mine in your heart and in all your being. Tie them on your hand as a sign. Put them at the front of a headband around your forehead. Teach them carefully to your children, talking about them when you sit at home, when you're traveling on the road, when you lie down, when you get up. Write them on the door frames of your house and on your gates, so that you and your children will live long in the land that and I swore to your ancestors he'd give them for as long as there is a sky above the earth. For if you will take care to obey all of these commandments I'm giving you, to do them, to love Adonai your God, to follow all of his ways and to cling to him, then Adonai will expel all these nations ahead of you, and you will dispossess nations bigger than stronger than you are. Wherever the sole of your foot steps, it'll be yours. Your territory will extend from the desert to the Lebanon, and from the river, the Euphrates River, to the Western Sea. No one will be able to withstand you. Adonai, your God, will place the fear and dread of you on all the land you step on, as he told you. See, I'm setting before you today a blessing and a curse. The blessing if you listen to the commandments of Adonai, your God, I'm giving you today, and the curse if you don't listen to the commandments of Adonai, your God, but turn aside from the way I'm ordering you today, and you follow other gods that you've not known. When Adonai, your God, brings you into the land you are entering in order to take possession of it, you are to put the blessing on Mount Gerizim and the curse on Mount Eval. Both are west of the Jordan, in the direction of the sunset, in the land of the Canaanites living in the Arabah, across from Gilgal, near the pistachio trees of Moray. For you are to cross the Jordan to enter and take possession of the land Adonai your God is giving you. You are to own it and live in it. And you are to take care to follow all the laws and rulings I'm setting before you today. So far in Deuteronomy, 
Moses' sermon has been covering the broad and underlying, the foundational, if you would, God principles of the law rather than specific ordinances, specific laws. He has reviewed Israel's history, reminded them of God's gracious election of them as a set-apart people, what happened to them out in the wilderness and how the Lord has cared for them, and what their attitude should be about the proposition that he's set before them. That is, Jehovah has made Israel an offer that Israel most certainly can refuse. He has offered to be their God, and in turn, they'll be his people. He has offered to establish a special and unique relationship and union with Israel, but only if they want it. And the way they must show God that they indeed want it is to ratify this new covenant that's been made at Mount Sinai by, first, agreeing with it corporately, but second, by diligently following its terms. Look, sometimes we miss a rather significant point about Israel's acceptance of this covenant of Moses. It's not that if Israel accepts it, that they receive the blessings of the covenant, and if they reject it, they receive the curses contained in the covenant. It's that if they choose not to accept the covenant, if they choose to refuse the offer of friendship with God, then so be it. Israel is simply thrown back into the generic pool of nations that forms all the earth's people, the pool from which they were taken in the first place. And they will be looked upon as no better and no worse or different than any of the rest of the peoples and nations. They won't be eligible for special blessings contained in the law, nor will they be subject to special curses of the law more than any other of the millions of people on planet Earth. The deal is, if they do accept the covenant, and if they do enter into a special covenant relationship with Jehovah God, then they'll be subject to its blessings and its curses. Blessings come from following the terms of the covenant, following its laws. Curses come from violating the terms of the covenant, breaking its laws. But these blessings and curses only apply to those with whom God has made the covenant. It's not for others. Israel's acceptance of this covenant at Mount Sinai doesn't put pagan Gentile Mesopotamia under the curses of the law, for example. Now, I tell you this for two reasons. First, because it's a common misconception that those not under the covenant therefore automatically suffer the curses of the law. And those who are under it automatically receive the blessings of the law. And second, because this helps to further cement the reason that Paul went to such length particularly in his letter to the church at Rome, to explain that Gentiles get grafted into Israel, meaning into Israel's covenants with God, when they come to faith in Yeshua. If we didn't get grafted into Israel's covenants, we have no covenant. We have no right to partake of their terms or the covenant they made. But Gentile Christians remember this. This covenant has terms. And when you and I accepted Christ, we accepted all of the covenant's terms, not just the ones we prefer. Now recall last time that we read 
that pivotal chapter in Jeremiah chapter 31, whereby it explains that the Lord is going to create a new covenant. This is one that will later be called the new covenant under Christ. But let's remember with whom that covenant was going to be created by and between. Hear these words, Jeremiah 31, 31. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. End of statement. Between the Lord and the house of Judah and the house of Israel, there was to be a new covenant. Essentially between exactly the same people who the covenant of Moses has been established. Therefore, the issue for Gentiles is, how do you gain access to the wonderful provisions of that agreement that Christians call the New Covenant that belongs to Israel and to all who would be joined to Israel? And the answer to that issue is faith in the Jewish Messiah, Yeshua of Nazareth. That brings us into the fold. That is the one and only entry ticket that is demanded, and God sells the tickets. That's the one allowed and needed thing for joining into that redemption that's provided by Israel's covenants. Verse 1 of chapter 11 opens with the basic foundational rule for Israel that's also the attitude with which Israel's to enter into the covenant relationship with God. It's very simple. Love him. Love him. Notice that immediately upon saying love him, what it means, what to love him means is laid down. And it says, obey his laws, rules, and commandments. This is not complex. It's just hard to do. Now, there is a subtle but important shift in the issue being dealt with in Deuteronomy 11. Versus chapter 10. In chapter 10, the issue is acceptance or rejection of the covenant relationship with God. Does Israel choose to enter into the covenant that's being offered, or do they not? But chapter 11, the issue is that once that covenant is accepted, the next decision for Israel, both corporately and as individuals, is obedience or disobedience to the terms of the covenant and what the consequences for both choices are. I want that difference to be well stamped onto your mind, so let me illustrate it. If you were to purchase a home, and you draw up a contract, and you look that contract over, and you see what the terms and the provisions that the seller demands are, and you make a decision as to whether you want to enter into that contract or not. And if you decide, no, no, I don't. I don't want to do this deal. There's nothing gained or lost, maybe a little bit of your time. That's it. You don't have any obligations to a contract you never signed. There's no penalties at that point because there was never an agreed to deal. This is the situation with Israel up to Deuteronomy chapter 10. The contract, the Mosaic Covenant, with all of its terms, all of its blessings, all of its curses, has been presented to Israel by God through Moses. Now it's up to Israel to enter into that proposed contract or walk away from the deal. If they decide no, there's nothing gained. But there's no inherent penalty that we've been made aware of. Back to the house analogy. If you do decide to accept the terms of that house contract and sign the papers, indicating a complete free will acceptance of its terms, then everything changes. If you follow through with the terms, then you get the enjoyment and security of that house that will provide you with shelter. But if you violate that contract's terms, you might lose the house. And there are often stiff penalties to boot. That is what Israel is doing in chapter 11. It is presumed 
that they have accepted the terms of the Mosaic Covenant. They've entered into a contract with God. So now what is being contemplated is what the results are going to be for following through with the deal, as well as the penalties if they violate that deal's terms. So from verses 2 through 7, Moses explains he's not asking Israel to take on mere faith the experiences from another generation, but many of them have themselves personally witnessed what he's calling to mind of their history. Certainly many Hebrews who are now about 60 years old out in the wilderness have even seen what happened in Egypt because they would have been around 20, a little under, when they left Egypt. And this is because, generally speaking, even though all of the first generation of the Exodus had to die off before God would allow them to enter into the Promised Land, those affected by that were 20 years and older at the time of the Egyptian Passover. It was that age group, 20 years and older, that was considered to be of the age of personal accountability. So as you can imagine, all that happened in Egypt and then in 40 years of the wilderness wandering was quite vivid and real in the minds of those who were in, say, their 50s. Not all of those standing before Moses experienced everything Moses was speaking about. Most of those alive at that moment were born during this arduous desert journey. However, a great number of Israelites experienced at least some of it. So they had no reason to doubt Moses or to deny what they had personally seen. Therefore, Moses says in verse 8, If you want to experience the blessings of what the Lord has waiting for you in Canaan, then obey his commandments. The bottom line, that you were born as Hebrews, is not sufficient for you to be blessed by the good things of the land. Rather, you must also be obedient to the covenant that you've just agreed to. Obedience was the key to everything that lay ahead for Israel. The next several verses seem straightforward, but there are some interesting insights that you might appreciate that are added to their impact. The land of Egypt and the land of Canaan are hereby compared and then contrasted. And Moses says, Canaan's not at all like Egypt. Because in Egypt, you had to work to get water to your fields. But in Canaan, God's going to water your fields for you. With just the right amount of moisture. Egypt was a relatively flat land. Canaan's generally hilly, with valleys. Egypt was like any other land on earth in that, whatever, that it became whatever its inhabitants made of it. But Canaan, says the Lord in verse 12, he'll look after it and he'll tend it. Now let me share something with you that can be a little hard to understand. In verse 10, the complete Jewish Bible says there in Egypt, you'll sow, you would sow your seed and you had to use your feet to operate its irrigation system. Now this rather standard English translation is what's called a dynamic translation. And it's probably a pretty good one. Because what's being described here is indeed the man-made irrigation system that was so vital in Egypt's agriculture. A system of canals and reservoirs and channels were built to water the fields using water from the Nile, which was essentially Egypt's only water source. Human feet were used in several different kinds of operations to make the irrigation work. They used, in some cases, a kind of water wheel, which was usually human-powered. They employed a shaduf that was essentially a bucket on a rope with one end tied to a lever. A person would allow the bucket to dip into a reservoir of water, and then using a leverage would lift the filled bucket up, dump it into an irrigation canal. There was a lot of work involved here because it's estimated that during the approximately 100-day growing season in Egypt, a thousand tons of water was needed per acre to ensure a proper crop. That's a lot of water. The system Egypt devised was amazing. They used scores of thousands of shadufs 
hundreds of water wheels. Several other clever methods as well for getting water to those channels and then out to the fields. But don't confuse this process with the natural overflow of the Nile during the flooding season that didn't so much water the land as it provided rich nutrients contained in the silt that fertilized the fields before they were planted. Also understand that Egypt was for the most part a desert. Practically no rainfall occurred at all. The waters of the Nile came from deep within another area of Africa, upstream from melting mountain snowpacks. Egypt simply benefited from the river's direction of flow. So with all this as a background, it's easy to imagine how proud Egypt must have felt to have developed this elaborate irrigation infrastructure and how they felt dependent upon only their own efforts to grow crops. That situation would be completely reversed in Canaan. In Canaan, the Lord says, you won't need human-powered irrigation systems. He would bring rain from the sky upon their crops. For this, all they had to do was to wait, to be obedient, and to keep their hearts, their minds, firmly set upon him. The rains would be sufficient to provide grain for the people, grapes from the vines, fruit from the trees, grass for the herds. And they wouldn't have to work to do it. But, warns Moses, don't fall prey to your own human inclinations by giving the praise for the rain and the good crops and the ease at which it all happened to one of those Canaanite gods. And of course, that's exactly what the Israelites eventually did. But the temptation to misdirect their gratitude would have been great because they were going to live among the people who had long ago cleared the land added fertilizers, made stone fences to both pen in animals and keep them out of the crops. It was a difficult task not to offer sacrifices to the gods of these peoples, even if just trying to be tolerant so that they can maintain a peace. And God says, but if you succumb to this evil, then he's going to turn off the rain. The ground is going to become hard and Israel is going to suffer and maybe won't even survive. So counsels Moses in verses 18 through 21, employ the several God-ordained visual reminders to stay faithful to Yehovah. And among these reminders are the tefillin, the mezuzah, the presence of the priesthood and of the tabernacle, and the constant teaching of God's laws to the children. And if Israel will do this, then they'll possess the land forever. Step one of Israel possessing the land is for Canaan to be emptied of its current residence. And the Lord says if Israel will demonstrate love towards God in the form of obedience, then the Lord himself will expel the Canaanites and en enable Israel to succeed. Therefore, the promise of victory over Canaan is entirely conditional on Israel following through with the terms of the Mosaic Covenant. Those terms it's what we usually call the law. And the extent of the land holdings that Israel would receive is now outlined in, verses, in verse 24. And only during King David's time did Israel ever possess anything close to this wide range of territory. In essence, this is the heavenly ideal for the mass of land set aside for Israel's possession. But since the deal was conditional... And the Hebrews started breaking the terms of the covenant, covenant almost immediately upon crossing the Jordan River. The penalty, the curse, was that God didn't expel all the peoples that occupied Canaan. So Israel never gained all that had been set aside for them. So before we enter chapter 12, that begins to enumerate the individual laws and rules and what they mean, from verse 26 to the end of this current chapter, it speaks of the moment of decision for Israel. 
Now the decision to accept the covenant is foregone. What is meant here by curse and blessing is that the covenant they've already accepted contains both of those elements. So Israel must decide to abide by what they've agreed to or they're going to experience God's severity. And the first thing God enjoins Israel from doing is bowing down to the gods of Canaan. However, in verses 29 and 30, a different agenda is discussed. It is that once they enter into the land, that Joshua in the lead, they are to have a ceremony. It's a ceremony that will reaffirm the Mosaic Covenant to which they had agreed about a year after leaving, leaving Egypt. Now in Deuteronomy chapter 27, this topic is taken up in more detail, detail and indeed in the book of Joshua 8.35, we find the ceremony of reaffirmation actually occurring. Why was this renewal, this reaffirmation necessary? It's interesting that this will be the third time the covenant of Moses has been ratified. The first time was at Mount Sinai. The second is what we just covered at the last couple of chapters of Deuteronomy in the land of Moab, the third time will be after Israel has entered the promised land. At least one theory about this series of reaffirmations is that it was customary for most covenants and treaties of that era. When a leader with whom the treaty has made died, then the new leader had to revalidate the covenant and this was accomplished with a ceremony. Moses died after the second agreement to reaffirm the covenant. And so with Joshua as the new leader of Israel, the third affirmation was required. But again, in the eyes of the people anyway, it also probably had to do with leaving behind the spiritual authority of one territory entering into the spiritual sphere of influence of another. That is, as Israel left Mount Sinai, the dwelling place of God, and entered Moab, where another god was thought to rule, it would have been customary to reaffirm a treaty with the spiritual authority over that land. And recall, as we've discussed on numerous occasions, that the ancients thought that various gods controlled various parcels of land. So since it was a basic necessity of all treaties that a vow was made, and that a vow by definition meant invoking the name of a god, and the name of the god invoked had to be the one who was in charge of the territory where that treaty was made. If one were in Egypt, Egypt's god would be invoked. If one were in Moab, a different god would be invoked. By reaffirming the Mosaic Covenant in the land of Moab, the name of Jehovah's authority was being attached to that territory. By affirming the covenant again in Canaan, Jehovah's authority was being extended to that territory. That was what they were thinking. Now it's interesting as well that the place where this covenant reaffirmation ceremony was to eventually take place was defined. Mount Gerizim and Mount Ebal. The road to Shechem cuts in between them, with Gerizim to the south of the road, Ebal to the north. What's interesting is, is that on Mount Gerizim, the blessings of the Torah are to be proclaimed, but on Mount Ebal, the curses of the Torah are to be proclaimed. Believe it or not, there is real logic and pattern behind this choice. Recall our study of the spiritual significance of the direction east. Also recall in our study of how the encampment of Israel was ordered in such a way that certain groups were assigned permanent camping locations according to the four major compass points. East is always preeminent. When one faces east, what direction is on your right? South. When facing east, Mount Gerizim was to the right, to the south. Since the right side is the mightier and the more regal, then Mount Gerizim was given the privilege of having the covenant blessings read from it. As one faces east, 
then the left is north. And to the north was Mount Ebal. Left is not a cursed direction. It's just not as good. It's just not as mighty as the right. So the curses of the law were pronounced from Mount Ebal that it was to the left side, the north side. And by the way, these two mountains, the very place where the covenant of Moses was reaffirmed, now lies in what the world calls disputed territory the so-called West Bank. I think we'll call it a day and we'll begin Deuteronomy chapter 12 next week. Would you please rise? Thank you.